George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Joe Biden is 80 years young today. That means he'll be 82 when he begins his second term. 86 when it finishes. How they used to laugh at Chernyenko and Andropov and the sclerotic aging Soviet leadership. So Joe, if you see, I don't know, sparklers and, and birthday cakes and paper hats and things, it's for you. You may not realize it, but it is your birthday. <laughs> I'm just wondering if he actually does know that it is his birthday. He hasn't opined yet. And what a lot of huffery and puffery of hypocrisy I've been listening to all day on the road about the World Cup in Qatar. Ask this question of yourself. Which country exactly in the world today is ethical enough to be granted the right to hold a major sporting contest? The United States of America, which is almost certain to host the next World Cup, the players are kneeling in Qatar in memory of a black man that was choked to death by an American policeman with his knee on his throat. The United States has invaded and occupied and overturned the government of more than 50 countries since the Second World War. Has Qatar ever done so? Now, People say Qatar is not LGBTQ friendly, and neither is it, as no Muslim country is, as virtually no African country is, as at least 20 states in the United States of America is, and at least 100 mayors in Poland have just gone LGBTQ Free, why are you picking on Qatar? And across the border in Saudi Arabia, they're getting ready to host the Formula One Grand Prix. They've already had blood on the tracks in Bahrain where they gun down their own people whenever they have the temerity to come onto the street. So why are you picking on Qatar? This rampant Orientalism of Countries that massacred the indigenous populations, enslaved. Why was George Floyd in America? Because his great-grandparents were brought there in chains as slaves. And you want to lecture other people on human rights? As a footnote, let me say, I'm banned from Qatar. I have absolutely zero connection to Qatar. I'm against Qatar's role in Syria, it's role in Afghanistan, it's role in Yemen. They won't let me in the country, but I still denounce the hypocrisy that I've been listening to all day. There's much, much more of this. As Betty Davis said, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. So happy birthday, Mr. President, as Marilyn Monroe famously said to a real U.S. President, Jack Kennedy, in the prime of his life, unlike Joe Biden, who's celebrating, if he even knows it is his birthday, his 80th this very day. Now, he's probably going to be facing up to the mere stripling that is Donald J. Trump, who's back 
on Twitter. Let me start with the Twitter issue because I've just been upbraided by a follower of mine for welcoming Donald Trump back to Twitter, although he hasn't showed up yet. All his old tweets have re-suffered, and boy, have we missed the entertainment value. But ask not for whom the bell tolls, said John Donne. It tolls for thee and for every man. And no man is an island, said the same John Donne, entire to himself. Of course, the taking away of the free speech rights of Donald Trump is the taking away of everyone's free speech rights. Our right to hear him, and it moves the dial that much closer to the day when they cancel you. There's a lot of self-cancellation going on at the moment. Man buns are being torn out, tears shed into man bags, skinny jeans being rendered because of the mass redundancies of engineers in the Twitter industry. I'm not sure many of them have ever been inside a boiler suit or had to wash their hands in Swarfiga, but they call themselves engineers. Thousands of them have gone, either been sacked or walked. Apparently, Musk is operating the Twitter platform with 50 people rather than 8,000 people that were there before. In which case, that was there have been a lot of fun. In which that case, was there have really been a lot of fun. That when I saw the able working conditions of the when I see Twitter engineers and the high water salaries and the high water I now realize why they've had to be dragged. I now realize why they've had to be dragged screen on. I am, always have been, and always will be, firmly opposed to any changes in the law to allow assisted dying or assisted suicide. I believe the threat to the dependent, the most vulnerable, um, the most desperate in our society is simply too great. And therefore, assisted dying or Legalize, legalized assisted suicide must never become law in this country. Thank you, George. Thank you very Bravo. much. Bravo. I, I agree entirely and uh, spoke, uh, I hope, powerfully in Parliament against this euthanasia, legalized murder. I have uh, the most profound feelings of opposition to it, which as you say, it does not mean that the pressures on a people who are terminal, who have lost hope, are not uh, themselves profound, and that the pressures on people without pay and without any kind of remittance or relief are condemned to years, decades of caring for people who are terminally ill, helpless, hopeless, and so on, that these are not deep, deep minds of anguish and of pain and of doubt. But I have a moral and religious obligation to oppose it. If capitalism was a person and it could kill anyone that it liked, it would kill the one that will never again turn a penny of profit. It's very easy to imagine. Relatives, even family members, even husbands and wives that would like to see the back of you, either because they think you've suffered long enough or because they'd quite like to see what's in your will and quite like to spend it. I wouldn't trust and I don't think you should anybody to decide whether you live or die. As a religious believer, I believe that that is God's job, not yours. This is a subject we'll have to uh, return. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. There is 
is no trick other than hard work, creativity, care, and recognizing that duty is more important than love. The booming voice of Robert Maxwell, an arrogant man who used his publishing empire to gain him power and influence. But in this shocking account, never told before in this way, George Galloway recalls his first encounter with Maxwell. It looked like a, a grizzly bear uh, advancing towards me and punches me with these giant fists like sides of ham right in the solar plexus so hard that i literally bent double then after george exposed maxwell as a crook in parliament it was war every one of his papers the daily mirror then following the sunday mirror the sunday people the daily record then a few days later the sunday mail in scotland even the european which he then owned all over Galloway. Scottish Daily News journalist Ron Mackay was there. Every night, presumably when he had a drink in him, he would boom over the tannoy about the, 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 the cretins, the fools. But the majority of the workforce believed that he would take it over and their jobs would be secure. But of course he didn't. He just disappeared. And then... Millionaire newspaper publisher Robert Maxwell is dead. What really happened? Did Robert Maxwell jump or was he pushed? It could be that he went out to, as he did, miturate over the side of the boat. I'm with Ghislaine Maxwell in that I lean towards the murder. This is Maxwell the monster. If you said, what is my secret. I will let you and your viewers know what it is. I'm not attached to property. Consequently, losing it or gaining it means nothing to me. Well, that'll go down as the greatest monologue never heard by anybody. I was just on a roll about the software engineers tearing out their man buns, crying into their man bags, rending their skinny jeans, throwing their sneakers out of the window in rage at the new Musk era. Now, Musk's done nothing for me, absolutely nothing. And I still demand that he removes the unjust and untrue Kremlin label that Twitter still publishes on every one of my tweets, even when it's about my boys and their football matches and the trophies that they are winning. It's completely grotesque, but I'm fully behind Musk's decision, taken actually after a poll of, I think, 15 million people at one stage, a million people per hour were voting on a poll of whether or not to bring back Donald Trump. And as I was saying earlier, I hope you heard it, uh, the, the, no, the ask not for whom the bell tolls. When they take away the right to speak of Donald Trump, they're taking away your right to hear Donald Trump. And they're taking away your right to criticize and attack what Donald Trump is saying. But if you can't hear what he's saying, then you are not in a position to evaluate it. Who knows, like a stop clock, he might twice a day at least be right. But you'll never know because they've choked off his free speech uh, pipeline. But the more important point of view for you is if you cheer on the restrictions on other people's free speech rights, the day will come when they come for you. This much is so blindingly obvious, it is astounding that millions of people can't see it and voted indeed in that poll uh, to exclude Trump from Twitter. Now, he hasn't come back, but I, I'm sure that he will, especially now that the 80-year-old uh, springling uh, Joe Biden has uh, begun uh, the appointment through Garland, his attorney general, uh, of a special counsel to investigate alleged crimes by Donald Trump. They must think that we uh, all are blind. 
they are seeking to criminalize Trump out of the presidential race because they are terrified that they will lose to him again. Because I've just been looking at uh, a clip from Trumpland by the peerless uh, Michael Moore, uh, whose filmmaking skills I defer to and whose voice in voiceover is second to none. I've just been watching what he said prior to the 2016 election about Donald Trump. I can't play it to you because Hans Zimmer's music is on it and we'd get a copyright strike. But I urge you to look out for it. It's on Twitter now and on other medium. And it is positively brilliant. It is genius. There are the pictures of it. In it, Moore describes Trump as a human Molotov cocktail, as a human hand grenade that can be legally tossed into the midst of the elite. And he still is. And when you look at the people that hate Donald Trump, they are the very people that are hated by hundreds of millions of people around the so-called Western world. The elites hate Donald Trump. The media hates Donald Trump. The professional political class hates Donald Trump. Wall Street and the city hate Donald Trump. The man buns with their man bags hate Donald Trump. But most people hate all of the above. And that's the problem for them about a real live Trump back on Twitter, back in the presidential race. Michael Moore, in that uh, Trumpland clip that you've just seen but couldn't hear, he describes the day prior to the election in 2016, when Trump confronted the Ford Motor Company's executives in Detroit, Michigan, and said to them publicly, on camera, I hear you're planning to make your next models in Mexico and to close these factories here in Michigan. So I want you to know that if you do, I will place a 35% tariff on your cars and nobody will buy them. Now, as Moore says, it doesn't actually matter all that much whether Trump meant it or not. It doesn't matter nearly as much that he didn't, at least not fully, fulfill his pledges to the Rust Belt states, the Brexit states, if you like, in the United States. It's the fact that he had the balls to say what no other presidential candidate, Democrat or Republican, would ever have said to the elites, whether they meant it or not, they would never even have said it. And Trump still remains that potent threat to these vested interests. If he does run, and if he does make it against young Joe Biden, then obviously the pressure has to be on him to deliver what he promises. But if he runs with those promises, and he includes in his platform an end to the endless wars of the United States, I think he'll do quite well. And more importantly, so do the elites think he'll do quite well. And that's why they've appointed a special counsel to try and put him out the game. We'll be talking to the great Nico House later, one of my favorite, all-time favorite guests, about Trump, Biden, and the upcoming race for the Republican nomination and the retiral of crazy Nancy Pelosi, who at the age of 82 has decided to step down uh, from the minority leadership in the Congress. People say that she broke the glass ceiling and that standing down uh, is a pity. I think standing down is better than falling down, which she's been doing quite a lot recently because she has swilled her way through decades at the top of American political life. She's done nothing for the 
working people in the United States, except make them poorer and expose them to more and more danger in needless wars around the world. Mind you, her family have done very well. They are now billionaires, the Pelosi's, billionaires. Her husband has shown an uncannily, canny appreciation of what's likely to happen on the stock market. I'm sure that they've got other things to talk about on the pillow and that she's not sharing U.S. government secrets and analysis with her stockbroker husband. I'm sure they're talking about even more interesting things like their separate lifestyles. But the fact is, her husband has become a billionaire during the period in which she has been at the top of American politics. Where was I? I was talking about the changes that are on their way in America. And I believe that they are profound and that they need to be. Because, frankly, an American intelligence official, as yet unnamed, though he will have to be named, there will have to be a congressional inquiry into it, one of many, almost dragged the world into World War III last week. An intelligence officer told CNN that a Russian missile had been fired at Poland and that Article 5 of the NATO treaty would now have to be triggered and that a state of war between the multiply nuclear-armed powers in NATO and the hypersonically nuclear-armed power of Russia would now exist, a state of war that would bring about the end of Europe and perhaps when it went intercontinental, the end of the whole world. CNN unleashed the dogs of war and cried havoc. And those dogs ran within 60 minutes across every single part of the mass media in every Western country, but in particular, the heart of darkness of the so-called Western world, which is the Anglosphere, your sphere and my sphere, to whom I'm talking today. The Anglosphere was driven crazy within 60 minutes of an entirely fake, bogus report being carried on CNN and sourced, poorly sourced, said Jim Clancy, the former CNN legend, just this very day. And the world can't afford to be at the mercy of these ravenous dogs any longer. So if Trump runs as the anti-war candidate, He's got my support, and I think he'll have the support of many across the world and, of course, most importantly, across the United States. I've lost a lot of time because of that interruption, which I'm claiming is uh, some kind of sabotage, but we'll see. We'll have a post-mortem later. Only time for me to say this. Qatar ain't my country, ain't my favorite country. And I ain't their favorite guys. But they are being treated to a festival of Orientalism right at this moment. They're being mocked. They're being insulted. They're being slandered. When all they've done is spend hundreds of billions of their pounds on investments in Western countries and on the ownership of some of the most important football clubs in the world, and, of course, on the World Cup itself. Not on their own team, whose pathetic nature was shown ingloriously in the opening game today when little Ecuador uh, gave them two, going on ten. But they are putting their money in the service of the football world, people like me, who love, I mean truly love, to see the World Cup. Now, I don't know if you know, but Qatar was a British colony 
until 1971. And the Beatles were only just dead when Britain gave up its colonial power in Qatar and it became an independent country. Don't you think the BBC, the beating heart of the British Empire, ought to show a little more humility before lecturing us, before the game kicked off, about Qatar's human rights record? I don't know what their human rights record is in detail. I just know it's better than ours. I just know it's better than America's. I just know it's better than Saudi Arabia's and Bahrain's and the United Arab Emirates and a hundred other countries I could name that nobody in the Western media ever criticizes at all. I'm sorry my monologue was so rudely interrupted. But we've got some great guests coming up. Stay tuned. I'll be back in just a minute. The 1897 edition of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, read by George Galloway, available only on Patreon. The cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens! said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash on Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily, the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. I hope you're enjoying uh, The War of the Worlds, H.G. Uh, Wells' masterpiece written in 1897 that I'm reading on Patreon. I ain't no Orson Welles, but I'm one of the best in his absence at reading uh, stories like that. And uh, I don't know about you, but it scares the life out of me, and it's me that's reading it. It is a truly frightening story, which when Orson Welles read it in 1938, had people jumping off bridges cars crashing into each other, as people thought it was actually current events. One man who faces the gravest of dangers every single day, reporting current events, unlike virtually every other so-called journalist and broadcaster in the world, in their uh, studios, around their makeshift sand pits, telling us what they don't know about the war in Ukraine. My first guest, is on the front line, and he makes you proud to be British. He is the indefatigable press TV correspondent on the front line in Ukraine. That's right. He's Johnny Miller. Johnny, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm a big admirer of your work. I want to talk to you later about the difficulties of finding you on Twitter. You're clearly uh, shadow banned. I couldn't even tag you on Twitter, so I want you to tell everyone uh, towards the end of this interview how they can follow your work, which is truly outstanding, but you outdid even your own previous high standards by a very special interview that you have just uh, published. Uh, it is an interview with the young woman who was supposedly shelled by the Russians whilst giving birth, except the story was rather different. Tell us. Well, yes. Yeah, so this is a famous picture that was uh, broadcast all around the world of a woman who supposedly was shelled by a Russian airstrike. Now, I don't know whether it was a Russian airstrike or Russian artillery or something else, 
But this photo of her was broadcast all around the world. Interestingly, they, they didn't, they, most of the uh, world's, the Western media didn't interview her and ask her her thoughts. I found her recently in uh, uh, Makievko, the adjoining city's Don, uh, Donetsk, where I am now, and interviewed her and talked to her. And what she said was very interesting. Interesting. She said that uh, she was misrepresented by uh, the two journalists, two Ukrainian journalists working for a Western outlet. Uh, she uh, she ter turns out that she is essentially pro-Russian. Uh, she's not critical at all of the Russian military, and instead she blames the Ukrainian um, Ukrainian army for what's been happening here in Donbass. She's lived in Makievka, not far from where I am now. For since uh, well, for her life, she's been born here. She's lived under Ukrainian shelling. And instead of criticizing the Russian army, she's been criticizing the Ukrainian army for bombing Donbass civilians for the last eight years. Uh, and it's interestingly that a picture of this woman who's pregnant leaving a hospital in uh, in Mariupol has no criticism of the Russian army. Uh, doesn't hate Russia. She's a proud Russian citizen, and instead she blames Ukraine. This is an exceptional example of an innocent civilian being used for propaganda purposes. Of course, millions of people in the West, that picture was used to, to inspire hatred of Russia. And it turns out she doesn't hate Russia at all. She's living here happily under Russian rule. It reminds me of the um, famous picture of Omran, if, if you remember that, in Syria, the picture of that child in the back of an ambulance. Interestingly, I was in Syria at that time uh, when uh, Syrian forces recaptured that area. And I spoke to the father uh, with the child Omran sitting on his lap, who said he has no criticism of the Syrian government. So this is another example of an innocent civilian being used to uh, promote hatred of an, a so-called enemy state of the West. And it turns out the civilian in that picture doesn't hate that government uh, at all. So it's a fascinating story. And interviewing her, she's very happy being here uh, a fascinating story about how propaganda is used, uh, innocent civilians are used to promote hatred of certain governments. And it turns out that that photo uh, has a very different story behind it. Johnny, the, the, that's a great example of how uh, stories are shown but are entirely distorted, in this case reversed. A reverse image is used. On the other hand, I've seen... I hope no people of uh, tender uh, sensibilities has seen uh, the video shot by the Ukrainian forces this week of them murdering prisoners of war lying face down on the ground. That doesn't get shown anywhere. There's an example uh, of propaganda by omission. Uh, this is an extraordinary war at a time when we've got more journalists, more technology, more ability to capture and broadcast what is actually happening in a war than we have ever had. And yet we have virtually no real footage of this war. And that which we do is oftentimes a lie. Well, absolutely. I mean, I'll tell you something interesting, George. I mean, I have a contact with the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, you can believe him or not. But he says that not a single British or American media outlet has even applied to come to Donbass or Russian-held Ukraine. Uh, there, are, there have been French, there have been German, there have been Italian mainstream journalists here. I know that. I've met them. They've been allowed in. The BBC has a correspondent in Moscow. Uh, the Russians are allowing mainstream journalists in Moscow. But it's interesting what he told me, that not a single British and American media outlet have even applied to come here. And the reason that they haven't uh, applied, if that's true, or they haven't come, is because there are many honest mainstream journalists, to be honest, I've met some of them, fantastic people. But if you're a mainstream journalist, if you're, if you're any kind of journalist, here I am right now in Donetsk, you've got no choice but to report some very uncomfortable, inconvenient facts. Every day when I walk out of my apartment here in Donetsk, I worry about getting blown up. Uh, I was here for a month, I had to leave. I let lines all over my face, I look 10 years older because it's just how dangerous it is here. I had uh, breakfast with my translator, a local woman with a two-year-old child two days ago. She sat down on the couch next to me, I said, how are you? She said, we got bombed last night, my local school was bombed. Uh, she had a two-year-old child lying beside her. Uh, her body convulsed with every explosion. 
I went there, it was her school. It was a school that she went to school at, it was bombed. Um, that's the danger. I've been here for months on and off. I've been to the hospitals, the schools, the markets. I've seen the bodies in the street. You go to, a, I'll tell you one story. I went to it was a journal, fellow journalist's birthday at a local restaurant. We had a, just a, local, a, a meal at a local restaurant. I popped by a bus station, which I heard was bombed earlier. Bodies lying in the street. Turned up to the restaurant, told the journalist. They just shrugged. It's just another day in Donetsk. Ukraine has been bombing civilians here for the last eight years. And that's why Western journalists, I'm almost the only Western journalist here in Russian held Ukraine. There's a few other fantastic independent journalists who are here uh, on and off. But mainstream reporters don't come here because they would have no choice but simply to report the truth. They, you know, they can't lie that much. And the truth is that Ukraine has been bombing civilians here for the last eight years. And the vast majority of people here support Russia. And of course, that's a very inconvenient fact. Because while the mainstream media is promoting constant war here, they say there's no chance of peace unless Putin leaves, unless Russia leaves. They don't want you to know that Ukraine is also, this is also a civil war in a sense. The, the, the root is a civil war, now it's become a proxy war. But it's a civil war between Ukrainian ultra-nationalists and its pro-Russian population, which are mainly in the east and the south. And if people in, in Europe, people in Britain realize that, they would realize there is a peace to be had and new borders to be drawn. So reporters don't come to where I am now because they don't want you to know the truth. The Ukraine has been bombing people here for eight months and the vast majority of here, people here support Russia. That's why I'm pretty much the only Western reporter here because they simply don't want you to know these simple facts. Well, of course, uh, the eagle-eyed will have noticed already that whilst the BBC can operate in Moscow, uh, Russian television cannot operate in London. And in fact, anyone, whether a Russian or a British citizen, working for any Russian media would be committing a criminal offense for which they could go to prison for seven years. Russia allows the BBC freely to operate and propagandize in Moscow uh, and would allow them to go uh, to the uh, war zone if they wanted to cover the war, but they uh, do not, and as you say, have not even applied. But there was one British fellow uh, working there a few months ago. I forget his name, but uh, I'd never seen any of his work. But the British government seized his house in England, confiscated it because they didn't like his reporting from a war. You couldn't make it up, Johnny. Well, unfortunately, George, uh, you seem shocked and um, astounded by that, and quite rightly, but I've been working here months and I'm not shocked and astounded. And, and it's very serious here. As I said, I'm one of the only Western reporters here. And I won't lie to you, it's, it's very worrying. Almost every Western reporter here has either been sanctioned, as you say, or facing imprisonment. Uh, a friend of mine, journalist, German journalist, Alina Lip. I don't know about you, if you know her story. She's been threatened with three years imprisonment in Germany. Recently, I did a story in Crimea. Her mother has recently fled to Crimea. Why? Because she's been sanctioned by the German government. She's a lovely old woman. She's a spiritual healer. She's a, she works with handicapped children. She's a lovely, a lovely woman. We had a lovely stroll around uh, uh, some gardens there. She's just a normal, lovely woman. She went to the German... She's been sanctioned by the German government. They, they closed her bank accounts. She went to her bank manager, and you know what they told her? They said, well, maybe you can go to the church. Maybe the church will help you. This is a European citizen who's had their, who's had their bank account closed, and she has, what can you do? She's told me, you can't buy food, you can't pay your rent. This is the mother of a journalist. The German government, to get to Lena Lip, who's simply been reporting the truth here, she simply said that Ukraine has been killed. I've seen the court documents. They, they, she said that Ukraine has been killing people here for eight years and the majority of people here support Russia. These are two undeniable facts. And yet the German, co German government is threatening her with three years in jail. And now they've sanctioned her mother and her father. And now, as you say, a British journalist has been sanctioned. There's a French journalist who was an eyewitness at uh, what happened at, at Butcher, criticizing what, uh, the narrative around Butcher. He faced an assassination attempt in Turkey. He, he used the SBU. And for, for the few Western journalists who are here, George, I'm not going to lie to you. It's seriously worrying. 
I may well be sanctioned. I may well face imprisonment. I may well face assass assassination. I'm on a Ukrainian hit list. I mean, it's Verets. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you know about that. And it, this, this increasing war between the East and the West, any journalist who threatens it, of course, Julian Assange is in jail, as we know. Any journalist increasingly who steps over a line is in serious threat of imprisonment, sanctionment, or assassination. That's the reality we're now moving into, George. Johnny, how can people uh, see your work? How can they follow you? How can they support you? Yeah, well, I mean, I've, uh, I've recently started doing a lot more social media. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter. I think Johnny Mills is the, the, the tag on Press TV, of course, um, and uh, on Telegram uh, as well. Uh, but really, I think, um, I mean, increasingly, I heard you speaking before about this missile attack in Poland. And as a journalist here, as a correspondent, I have to report on the whole of Ukraine, and the news desk often asks me to comment on the whole of Ukraine. I often look at mainstream sources in, who are many journalists in the west of Ukraine. I'm increasingly thinking these, 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 these sources are not credible. Recently, Western media reporting that Russia had attacked Poland. It wasn't, it was Ukraine with these missiles. Um, and so increasingly, I'd ask also people to look out for independent journalists, for the journalists who are here, uh, because fantastic other journalists here who are reporting some fantastic stuff as well. Were you aware of how close we came uh, with this uh, entire hoax over the so-called attack on Poland? Uh, because here, uh, people couldn't get to sleep at, at that night, including me. Uh, because the media went completely insane. And all the next day, by which time the story had been entirely debunked, uh, to be fair, by President Biden talking in Bali, in which in the middle of the night he said, no, it, it's very unlikely that it was a Russian missile. But by that time, all the British papers had, uh, had been published. And so for a whole day, you had to go into the supermarket and see every front page talking about a Russian missile attack on a NATO member, which never was. Uh, did, did you catch the sense of how dangerous a moment that was? <laughs> well, here in Donetsk, you're under shelling all the time. So people are worried about their own things here. But I, I did get that sense. Yeah, and this is why one of the reasons you're increasingly hearing people in the mainstream or former mainstream uh, a former head of the French army recently came out and said, this war is not in European interests. Even the former uh, British general said, we need to promote peace here. Because the people who are retired start saying that this is war is not in European interests. You've got the, the, the extremist element in Ukraine is not just Russian propaganda. It's serious. And NATO are not going to be able to control these extremists. So the threat of this war turning into a world war, or NATO, Russia, Zaporozhia, nuclear plant has recently been bombed again by Ukraine. So when you're arming extremists in Ukraine, there's a very real threat of it getting out of hand. Uh, and that's why increasingly you're seeing mainstream figures in Germany and in, in Europe, uh, often retired figures who are no longer beholden to the party line, saying that this war particularly is not in European interests. But, in, but, but our media, continues to promote, which is in a few people in the American State Department's interests, it's very much an American war here in Ukraine, but increasingly you're seeing European mainstream figures, not just rebel journalists or speakers like you and me, George, but increasingly mainstream figures in Europe uh, saying that this war is not in European interests and the threat of this turning into a world war is one of the reasons for that. Johnny Miller, may God preserve you. Take care, my friend. Watch how you go. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. We've got a poll running. Politics has no place at the World Cup. Agree or disagree? You can vote on Twitter, on my YouTube channel. And if you are watching on YouTube, please subscribe to my channel and like the show. It makes a difference, I promise you. Or on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway. Overwhelmingly so far, people say that politics has no place at the World Cup. 76% agree on Twitter, 83% agree on YouTube, and as always, the most perspicacious of all on the Telegram channel, 87% agree. 
that politics has no place at the World Cup. Let me take a quick break and then it's over to you for some calls. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate, great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there, you know. I had a great mom. She was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland, and I love the Scottish food. It's great food. I said to Melania, you know, haggis. Look at that. What's more than more Scottish than that? Me. I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Show with George Galloway. Now, if you want to agree or disagree with anything I've said or any of the guests say, then you're more than welcome to call the show. If you're in the UK or Ireland... It's 08081-965522. That's 08081-965522. And it's entirely free of charge. If you're in the US or Canada, it's equally free of charge. You call us, we call you back, and it won't cost you a cent. It's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. Double four. Calls are a very important part of the show. If you are in the rest of the world, and I promise you there is a rest of the world outside of the UK and the US, it's plus four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. That's plus four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Kevin is in my old stamping ground of Glasgow. Wants to talk about the World Cup. Kevin, welcome. Me and George, how are you doing? All good. Nice to hear from you, sir. Good, thank you. What it is, is George, I was on tonight. I don't watch BBC, but because the, the World Cup was being viewed on that, put it on, and within five minutes, yeah. I actually turned it off because the bio they're spouting about human rights in Qatar. Now, I think it's, it's bully boy tactics from the media when they're not flagging up stuff like in Britain, America, they're bombing the hell out of any country they want. And then they talk about... Yeah, and what about the... And the human rights of their own people, Kev. Yeah, yes, of uh, course. We could talk about the human rights of Britain and Ireland over a century. We could talk about the human rights of the British Empire all over the world. We could yes. talk about Julian Assange's human rights. We could talk about George Floyd. We could talk about any of the egregious breaches of human rights in the United States, even against their own people, Kev? Hey man, that, that, moving on to that, George, exactly after so much about saving lives and stuff, why in Britain then did they not go around and look at abortion clinics and focus on pro-life as is instead of getting rid of life, if that makes sense? Well, I'll tell you what, it won't be long before they're opening euthanasia clinics. Mark well, my words. Abortion well, is bad enough from my point of view, but, but when, when, when there's a death panel sentencing your old granny uh, to death because she's really costing too much, then we'll know uh, about the real human rights uh, uh, mentality of our rulers. Yes, well, thanks for taking my call, George. I just wanted to get that out. Well, you got it out very well. Thanks, Kevin. Don't be a stranger. Joe is in New Jersey on Joe Biden. Go ahead, Joe. Hey, George. Hey, uh, power to the people. And God bless. Thank Julian. you. Man, God bless Julian. Stood for the people. Stood for right Thanks. and good. Hey, George, I want to talk about Thanks. these spineless cowards uh, that we see in our media on a daily basis uh, critiquing Russia in the Russian military. We see jo General Mark Milley and Lloyd Austin are nothing but spineless cowards with big, fat mouths who never won a war anywhere in their lifetime. They ran out of Afghanistan with their tails tucked between their legs like spineless pussies, and yet they're on our media endlessly as these uh, mega heroes. Let's not forget 
the withdrawal out of Vietnam, the, the, the mass retreat out of Vietnam. Let's not forget the greatest retreat in America's history out of Korea. Endless, we see the Russians kick the Americans' ass over there in Syria, put in, basically stalled that war, brought in, you know, a stall to it. And, uh, yeah, man, we got these, and that, I'll say it again, man, spineless cowards with big fat mouths who hide behind women and children and civilians in Washington, D.C., behind cameras. But they ain't got the balls to stand on the front line like a Russian general. You know, I, I, uh, it's just sickening. Hey, George, well, you have uh, Not only that, Joe, Joe, not only that, when they're on these television shows, they're being interviewed by ex-CIA, ex-security state, ex-FBI, ex-military, all these uh, so-called mainstream television stations are hiring a, a, a whole cadre uh, of spooks as their uh, sofa, permanent sofa uh, dwellers. So it's, it's the spooks interviewing the spooks, if you get me. Yeah. Hey, George, the other thing I wanted to bring to your attention, I think it's pretty important, and uh, I, I hope you don't take any, any uh, you know, it's constructive criticism. But week after week after sure. week, you know, on, on your show, we hear, I mean, in my opinion, you and your guests praising Donald Trump. We see the guests that you bring on, like last week, are, are pro-Trump, pro-Zionist, pro-apartheid. Let's not forget Donald Trump is the greatest ally of apartheid and Zionism. Let's not forget that it's Donald Trump who put Julian Assange where he is. And, uh, you know, it was Donald Trump who gave away Palestinian land and gave away Syrian land. And yet, you know, these folks say that they are the friends of Julian Assange. They are the friends of the Palestinian people. But they never speak of the Palestinian people. They don't speak of Julian Assange. They speak of Donald Trump. Donald Trump in my opinion, nothing more than a draft-dodging coward who, whose father felt as though he was too important to go to Vietnam for the American people, for, for the United States of America. It was six times that he dra dodged the draft because he was more important than the other people who went to Vietnam. You know, let's not forget Donald Trump casinos bankrupt. Donald Trump University bankrupt. Trump Airlines bankrupt. Trump Mortgage bankrupt. Trump... Trump boxing bankrupt, Trump meats bankrupt, Trump vodka bankrupt, Trump morality bankrupt. And, and these people spend all this time on Donald Trump when they could be speaking on, whether you like him or not, Arafat. You know, they could be speaking of Che Guevara. But he's not running. Uh, but he, uh, Arafat's not running. Arafat is not running for president. Now, I gave you plenty of time there, Joe. I hope you'll agree. And you adumbrated uh, many, but certainly not all, of the sins of Donald Trump. Uh, I'm not in second place to you on Julian Assange. I hope you wouldn't for a moment think that I am. I'm not in second place to you on Palestine. I hope you wouldn't for a minute uh, think that I am. But I'm talking about the two candidates likely to be vying for the presidency of the United States. And I don't love Donald Trump. I just hate Joe Biden more. I think that Joe Biden is a bigger danger to the peace of the world. I agree with Malcolm, a hero of mine, that the liberal is the fox in sheep's clothing. The conservative, the Republican, doesn't hide what he is. I'd rather deal with them than someone in sheep's clothing who wants to eat me once that sheep's clothing has been discarded. But you are free, as you have just done, to critique my analysis of that. When the time comes, you're going to be faced with choosing... Joe Biden, or Donald Trump for president. You can't vote for Arafat. He's not on the ballot. 
You can't vote for Assange. He's not on the ballot either. And if you think that the world will be a safer place with Joe Biden having a second term, then you and I are a long distance apart. But thanks uh, for the call. And please, everyone feel free to come in and to agree or disagree with the line that I am taking. And incidentally, Joe, you're quite wrong uh, in your description of the guests that I have. Jackson Hinkle is a communist. He's not a Donald Trump man. Garland Nixon is the farthest thing from a Donald Trump man that you could possibly get. He sits on the left of politics like me. But both of them, I think, agree with me that Biden is more dangerous than Trump is and that the Democrats, because they're hypocrites as well as warmongers, are more of a danger to the American people and the world than the Republicans and Donald Trump are. That's the take we have. It doesn't make us lovers of Donald Trump. I would never describe myself in those terms. Now, thanks to the Super Chat uh, donors. Uh, as you know, I'm trying to get a Friday night show off the air, uh, on the air rather. Uh, it might be a Moats America, uh, not presented uh, by me, but presented by perhaps a rotating panel of American presenters. It would come on later at night so more Americans could join it. Uh, and it would be called the mother of all talk shows, USA, America. And I think uh, that there might be a market for that. Uh, I think actually there's a market for a moats Germany. There's a market for a moats France. There's a market for a moats Australia, South Africa. There's unlimited development that we could, if we had the resource, we could uh, explore and exploit. And the Super Chats are doing exactly that. So a big thanks to Sean McPartlin, who donated £4.49. Thanks, Sean. And a second donation from Sean of £1.79. And he asks, what's your views on the UK pulling from Mali? I confess, Sean, uh, to have no knowledge of that, but I will the next time you ask me. Uh, Alien Guru gives two US dollars. If you can take live questions from the people, when? Read. Give phone numbers. I gave you the phone numbers. And thanks for your two dollars. You can ask me questions anytime. Mr. Lover, a regular donor, I love you, Mr. Lover, gives two pounds. Ange 2099, another regular donor, gives two pounds. Remborn, an astonishingly generous regular donor, gives £50. Galloway Raider gives £4.49 and says, you're a Kremlin spy, George. I'm not, as it happens, but thanks for the £4.49. Matlas X gives US dollars. George, many of your countrymen's descendants live in East Tennessee and Appalachia. You can vote here in the USA as many times as you want for Donald Trump. Indeed, the hillbillies are from Scotland. Did you know that? I gave an interview to the unforgettable, eternally remembered uh, American television genius who was astonished to learn that the hillbillies came from Scotland. They were called billies because they were extreme Protestants who left the country in order to practice their version of Christianity. And they were billy boys, followers of King William of Orange. And that's how they came to be known as hillbillies. Uh, the uh, Chicka Boom Boom 2 gives five US dollars and says the Ukraine war is the greatest money laundering scheme in history. Weapons are being sold in the black market and Ukrainians buying property in Switzerland indeed. So let me squeeze in a call 
before the break. It's Richard in Manchester, who's always worth hearing. Go ahead, Rich. Hello, George. Thank you ever so much. Uh, I'm really, really enjoying the show tonight. It's very clear. That guy from America, I don't think he likes Trump. But I would have asked him a question, George, and that is, were there any wars whilst Trump was four years in the White House? And that should shut everybody. Well, there were wars, but he didn't. He didn't start any new ones. Put it that way. I'm sorry. Let me. Yeah, qualify. You're, you're quite right to pick me up on that. But I, yeah. I was watching George. Um, uh, this thing of um, the CEO of FTX, this young kid who's um, the Bitcoin company, who it will probably turn out to be the biggest scandal of all time. And uh, obviously people yeah. knew about it and they've used him and they'll carry on using him and send him to jail and then folk all the money, everything else that they do. It's typical. But I saw a little um, a clip of uh, Blair and Clinton on stage with this guy and I thought, well, that speaks volumes and you will know exactly what I'm talking about. But if I can... It was a wonderful pick. Uh, maybe we can put it up, uh, Richard, uh, while we're talking. Uh, Blair and Clinton, presumably in exchange for a large check, were in the Bahamas with this master thief who's stolen $10 billion from 5 million people and who was bribing uh, newspapers and magazines and news sites and was due to appear later this month, there's the pic, was due to appear later this month with Zelensky on a New York Times panel wow. in, the, in New York. Go on, Richard. Can I, can I just, George, can I carry on? Yes. Yeah. Um, Wednesday's decision from the Supreme Court in London about um, uh, Indy Rev 2, George, uh, concerns me a little bit. Thank you for all you told me about Scotland and whether it will get independence. And I have no axe to grind either one way or the other. But I was looking at the... Scottish Herald, and a reporter who I've seen you debate uh, many times, Leslie Riddick. She's a nationalist, extremist uh, activist. She is now. Uh, she's announced, uh, and she's trying to get together, um, you know, the usual uh, Alistair Campbell way, oh, there'll be 10 million supporters. But she's announced 10 different organized celebrations and put her name to it and said, please contact me to celebrate us getting independence on Wednesday. And I thought, that's a bit of a stupid thing to do. If the decision goes contrary to what Sturgeon and Campbell and, and the spin teams and all that want, surely, George, that's just... Um, it, it, it's tantamount to inviting well, violence. Yeah, well, uh, uh, stupidity and Leslie Ruddock are uh, words that often appear in the same sentence, Richard, so... I wouldn't trouble yourself uh, too much about it. Thanks uh, very much for the call. I've missed my break. I'll have to take it. But right after this very short break, the one and only Nico House is in the house. And I promise you, you don't want to miss him. Stay tuned. The airwaves. This savanna is a rigid dictoctomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You 
are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. By all means, uh, call the show, whether you agree or disagree. UK and Ireland, 0808196552. US and Canada, plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four, And the rest of the world, plus four four two zero three nine six six two six two five. There's so much to talk about, about the United States, the political class, uh, the Twitter, Elon Musk, uh, and the revolting software engineers in San Francisco. I can hardly stop myself from rolling these words. I wish I could devote the next hour to talking to Nico House, but I can't. But we'll make the most of the time that we've got. Nico's been a guest before, and he quickly became one of my favorites. He's the founder of MCSC Network, and host of the political radio show, Mi Casa Es Su Casa. And he joins us now from the United States. Nico, uh, welcome back. Where do I start? Do I start with the president's birthday? Is he in fine fettle? Is he looking ready for the next six years running your country? No, he looks like he's about to fall over any minute, honestly. It's, it's sad watching him talk. I'm not going to lie to you. It really is. I don't know why the Democratic Party and his family even keep putting him through this, but just let that put them out of his misery and let him leave off this. But, you know, how are you going to keep laundering billions of dollars into Ukraine if Biden isn't in power? <laughs> well, that's right. Uh, but the Republicans now control the levers of investigations uh, in the Congress, and they're bound to get busy, aren't they? on Biden. Uh, after all, there's no shortage of material. Uh, leaving aside his mental fitness for office, there's his role as vice president in the coup and in interference in Ukrainian political affairs. There is his son, Hunter, uh, and his business activities in Ukraine. Uh, and there's, uh, well, a hundred other uh, issues that they could well get busy on. Aren't the Democrats worried about that? So unfortunately, I don't think that they're worried about it because I believe it's a political sideshow. I believe that this is largely retaliation for what the Democrats did to Trump and the Republicans, bringing about the, I mean, admittedly frivolous impeachment. Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of things to impeach Trump on. They just chose something frivolous to impeach him on because it was really, once again, a political sideshow to drum up controversy ahead of an election. And I believe that that's what we're seeing again right now. I think that because the Democrats Democrats have the House, they're trying to go for the jugular because they do obviously want the Senate back. And then, of course, they want to win uh, come 2024. But I don't believe they're actually going to do anything. I believe that they had a plenty of things when it came to Benghazi and Hillary, a lot of things that they didn't even talk about uh, and nothing came of it. The reality is that even some of the Republicans are involved in a lot of the scandals that have taken place in the Ukraine. They're involved in a lot of the money laundering schemes. And at, at best, they let a lot of it slide. So you would end up implicating a lot of powerful people in the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party. And when it comes to power holding power accountable, at least when it comes to the United States, it just never happens. It did not, not, not anything significant anyway. We've had this information about Hunter Biden. They could have done something about it while Trump was president. They could have done something about it while Biden was running for president. And yet they chose not to, despite having the power to do so. So I don't, I don't really have high hopes for that. Uh, I do believe that it, you know, enough negative controversy could benefit them politically. But as far as any substantive accountability in that regard, I don't think it's going to happen. What about the latest uh, uh, scandal? Um, 40 million pounds was donated uh, by the now collapsed uh, Ponzi scheme uh, of one of the pillars of the Democratic Party establishment. Uh, And at the same time, that pillar was stealing perhaps as much as $10 billion from as many as 5 million people. Wouldn't the Republicans be fools not to seek to exploit that? 
Well, well, Republicans are fools, George. So let's just go ahead and clear that up. But, <laughs> but that entire situation is actually bizarre in a lot of ways. And it's mostly bizarre because of the established pattern that we've seen. A lot of people don't really see a lot of red flags when you see companies like this come out of nowhere. The moment that they, that uh, that exchange was able to buy uh, the, the Miami Heat basketball arena uh, because of how successful it became out of nowhere, and then a crypto exchange ended up being publicly traded on top of all of that, that should have raised red flags because we saw the same thing happen with Amazon. And we know Amazon is in the pocket of the CIA. We saw Google come out of nowhere and take over Yahoo. We know Google's owned by the CIA. We saw Facebook come out of nowhere and take over MySpace, out of literally out of nowhere. Once again, tied to the CIA and that Inc. Utel venture capitalist firm out of Arlington, Virginia. So this actually, is not as crazy as people might think it is. What's what's pretty crazy to me, however, is how quickly everybody made the connections between the Democratic Party, the money laundering, and FTX, and of course the ties uh, from the guy who just got arrested uh, to all the Democratic Party uh, elite. That's what's interesting. I do feel like the Republicans should take advantage of this, but I don't think they will. I just don't believe that they, because it, it comes back to this, right? Say they lose again, and then the Democrats retaliate by then holding them accountable. You're going to have a back and forth. We already, we're in the middle of a back and forth right now. But if you actually hold somebody accountable for any of the things that took place during Joe Biden's presidency, then you have to face the reality that if you choose to stay in office and you're one of the rhinos, then they're coming for you next. And it's just going to be a, a, ping, a ping pong effect that I don't think the Republicans genuinely want to deal with. Do you think that that will apply to the current legal moves against Trump, uh, that they will not go all the way with Trump because that might lead to the possibility of, uh, of the bitter being the biter uh, at yep. a later date? Do you think that that too is just showmanship? 100 percent you can even look at the impeachment of trump uh i don't know if you recall but tulsi had abstained and she actually voted to censor trump because when they introduced articles of impeachment it was about him bullying Zelensky, which wasn't true in fact funny enough it was biden who was actually guilty of threatening to withhold money from Zelensky for not firing that prosecutor but when tulsi introduced articles of impeachment it involved bombing syria without investigation that turned out over a chemical weapons attack that turned out to never have happened it was about selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, uh, and then, the, of course, they turning turn, them turning around and using them in Yemen. It was, it was, I mean, she, it was a long list of things that Trump actually had been guilty of, and these were impeachment-worthy offenses that the Democrats didn't even touch because they were approving the funding for that stuff. They were supporting the bombing of Yemen. In fact, they, the only problem that they had with the bombing of Yemen at the time is that Trump didn't get their permission first or not Yemen, excuse me, Syria, that, that they were just mad he didn't get their permission first. That was the only complaint, not that they didn't feel they needed to be bombed. So everything that they could have impeached Trump on, the Democrats were equally guilty of. And so once again, you're going to see this ping pong effect if anyone is genuinely held accountable. And I do have to say once again, it's probably a lot of the reason why you don't see people like Bill Clinton going to jail for being involved with Jeffrey Epstein, even though we know for 100 percent fact that he absolutely was involved with Jeffrey Epstein. Right. Because the Republicans start calling people out in that regard, then you don't know who in your party is going to be affected. And it just rolls downhill from there. Yeah, it's two cheeks of the same arse, as I uh, <laughs> have uh, described them. That much is uh, is clear. But there is a race between these uh, two cheeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I want to ask what your take on it uh, is. First of all, um, it, on the Republican side, uh, Trump has announced uh, that he's off and running. Now, he might be serious or he might be simply trying to make it more difficult for the uh, U.S. government to pursue him on criminal charges. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But if he's serious about running, do you think he'll win the nomination? And if he does, what happens in the election? So I do think he's serious. Uh, he's been going on basically a campaign tour for the last two years at this point, or last year, excuse me. Uh, I don't think that the charges will stick. I think he knows that. I think that they were bringing about the charges in order to threaten him and maybe coerce him into not running, and it just didn't work. Um, I do believe that he can win the nomination, and a lot of the reason why 
is because the, the, the Republican Party kind of needs him at this point. And I do believe that he's going to have a focus on election integrity, which is interesting because I do have to give him some credit. He was actually telling people to stay in line during the uh, midterms. Uh, he was telling people, uh, helping people understand their rights, uh, telling them not to basically tell them to be aware so that they're not cheated. And he actually didn't make it about himself, which is weird for Trump. So he might be showing some maturity in that regard. And then on the other side of that coin, you have Ron DeSantis, who is also, uh, even though he has his problems, obviously, as well, he's also an avid election integrity, uh, 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 act, I guess you would call him an activist, because he's actually fired people for violating election integrity laws. So when you have both of those people actively campaigning uh, and making sure that people are aware of election integrity, well, then at that point, the best person going to win, or at least the most popular person going to win, and with the party that Trump threw in Mar-a-Lago, I think that Ron DeSantis had a, a rude awakening. He had a wake-up call because all the fans that he had accrued over the last couple of years due to his, uh, I would say, favorable COVID policies. I lived in Miami, and Ron DeSantis actually did a very good job handling COVID. Uh, but all those people that, that love him, they were at Trump's campaign speech, his, his opening speech. They still love him. And there's a vested interest. I mean, I know literally people who became millionaires because Trump ran for office and was a president. Like they're not giving up their cash cow for somebody who basically is popular for running a very similar type of campaign as Donald Trump. They're not going to settle for one B when they can have one A. So I think that Trump will win the nomination. I believe that with the intense in, uh, focus on election integrity, that he actually has a chance to serve another four years. And to be quite honest with you, I just would prefer that than having Joe Biden be president because this is yeah been... me too. I, I just I just uh, <laughs> said so uh, uh, some minutes ago. Um, a lot of us are laughing. Uh, others are throwing up their hands in horror and clutching their pearls uh, about Elon Musk and Twitter. Yeah. Not just the return of Trump to Twitter. But the avowed, we'll have to wait and see if it, it actually turns out to have been true, but the avowed intention of the billionaire Elon Musk, I hope he's still a billionaire by the end of this. Uh, well, actually, I don't hope he's still the, a billionaire. The U.S. government will make sure he's still a billionaire, don't but, worry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he will. Um, uh, what, what's your take on it? How, how horrified are you by Elon Musk's tenure as the owner of Twitter. So let me just say, I'm super happy Trump is back on Twitter because it was kind of boring without him there, George. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie. I'm ready to be entertained again. So I'm going to just say that. I will give him credit for allowing him to be back, although he's not really doing anything. I mean, he just said he put out a poll on Twitter and then people said, yeah, we want him back. And then he let him back. I mean, you're just allowing free speech, I guess. But I don't actually support Elon Musk owning Twitter. I think that people are really not paying attention to just how influenced he is by the federal government and his connections within the federal government. SpaceX was supposed to be a civilian project, and somehow that turned to him getting billions of dollars of Pentagon contracts in order for him to create a weapon that could transport weapon, or excuse me, a, a ship that can transport any weapon system uh, within an hour to any part of the world and launch, like. That's not OK, people. Uh, also, I mean, he didn't even start Tesla. He just had a hostile takeover once again. So nothing that Elon Musk has like, I don't I don't, I don't want to say he hasn't earned anything, but yeah, basically he's never earned anything as far as his billionaire status is concerned. He is another one of these pawns like Jeff Bezos, who was part of a failed company. And then the United States came and bailed him out. Tesla wouldn't even be successful if it wasn't for the billions in subsidies that he was getting at the state level and at the federal level. And so he takes this money that he gets, he reinvests it into something like SpaceX, which by the way, you can, you can only invest in <laughs> if, you, if you invest in Google, because Google actually owns SpaceX, which is once again, owned by the CIA. And now that same guy who is that tied up with the CIA is in charge of Twitter. How much do we actually believe that there will be a positive outcome at the end of the day? Because the billions that he invested, that he used to buy Twitter, that's billions that came from the government. And eventually the chickens come home to roost. Uh, and when these elections go down and they will get crazy and they will get controversial, especially with Trump running again, Joe Biden being just as horrible and abhorrent as he was uh, this, uh, this term, 
they're going to start telling him to pull the levers. And we'll see how the world reacts. But he is no outsider. And I wish that people would stop saying that. I do believe that he's over attacked sometimes by liberals for the silliest reasons. I think that you would agree. But at, on the other side of that coin, he is dangerous. He's a very dangerous man. And what makes him so dangerous is that he's been able to give off this appearance as if he is an outsider when he is, in fact, not even close to one. In fact, I would say he's even more dangerous because he's the only guy that can have all these millions and billions of subsidies for Tesla here. And then simultaneously, he he actually is the only one, the only person who's, I guess, technically American that owns a bit a business, which is Tesla in China, that was allowed to stay open during the pandemic. And he doesn't have to have a Chinese business partner and partner in order to keep it running. That is how tied in he is with the most powerful governments in the world. And that doesn't bode well for us when he's the one who's now going to be control of, I would say, probably the most important marketing tool that we have in the world. Nico House, a pleasure as always to have no you. No problem. And when you're looking for that Moats America on Friday, let me know, man. I'll keep everybody entertained. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're definitely, if I get it off the ground, you're definitely one of the uh, hosts of the <laughs> show. I Appreciate promise you, you that's already uh, penciled in. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks, man. Nico, Thanks a lot for having me. And uh, the best of luck. Uh, now, uh, Nico was actually in Brazil uh, right there. Um, which uh, explains a slight delay. Uh, I think, uh, I hope it didn't spoil the interview. Politics has no place at the World Cup is the poll this evening. You can vote until the end of the show on that. I hope you've picked up our podcast, which is doing uh, remarkably well. It's number one in the charts in the most unlikely uh, places and in the charts in virtually every country in the world that allows uh, podcasts. I've got a roadshow, the second mother of all talk shows, Roadshow, coming up uh, February the 7th, Tuesday night, February the 7th, in Sunderland. You may have seen the film of the last one. Gayatri interviews the uh, people who are uh, in attendance and we make a little package of it. I think a great fun was had by all and everyone who's watched it since. There's the uh, flyer for it. If you want tickets, get them now because they're going like hot cakes. We sold out in Stockport with well over a month to go. It's looking uh, like this will be a similar event. So get your tickets now. Let me take a quick break and then it's your calls. We're charting now with our podcast in 130 countries and territories around the world. And we're in the top 10 in the United Arab Emirates, Indonesia, where we're number one, Croatia, Egypt, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Poland, and Nigeria, and even the Cayman Islands, even the tax dodgers. There's new episodes every Tuesday and Friday. You can listen to the very best of moats anywhere and at any time. You can also get the episodes a day earlier if you are a supporter of mine on Patreon. All my live shows, it's my extensive podcast archive, my audio books narrated by me. So please uh, consider supporting me on Patreon and get your moats podcast wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a five-star review will you now people are commenting on the show of course uh, live uh, on twitter and on facebook hugo on twitter says we americans have lost all sense of objectivity we're being bombarded with anti-russian rhetoric non-stop we americans have lost our minds. And Johnny Inglisi says Qatar was part of Bahrain, which was part of Iran since time immemorial, but taken off Iran in the 19th century by the British, who then eventually declared it as an independent country. It's hard to believe the British did that, but hey. Chip Walter says, George Galloway, I hope you realize a giant part of your American viewership are third-party voters. 
Please don't crap on our heads like that. We're on a short leash, laddie. <laughs> I'm not even sure what that means, Chip. But I say what I think. And moreover, I hand you the microphone to say what you think. Do you get that anywhere else on your American media? I don't think so. Uh, Fatima Benkeru says, George, what is little Rishi doing running to Ukraine to show his support for his friend Zelensky? Why does he think it's a good idea to pick a fight with China? Is he just showing off its small man syndrome? Fatima, when you're four foot 11, you've got to try and cut a dash and um, Zelensky's not much taller. Mary is in London, a new caller, and she wants to talk about Qatar. Go ahead, Mary. Hi, hi, George. Um, it's such a, a pleasure to speak with you on uh, on your show. You. Um, thank you for taking my call. I'm just uh, uh, about the whole Qatar situation, and I'm just uh, calling about how they're exposing it uh, at this time, and I just think it's absolutely crazy that they're doing it at this time because they've had these laws in place um, for since the beginning of time. And I love what you said earlier about parts of the USA having these same laws because I'm sure millions of people, especially in the UK, especially the young, they have no idea about this and they need that drilled into them. And you cannot expect, you know, every Mary, single... Mary, let yeah. me, Mary, Mary, let, let me stop you just for a second. I'll let you back in. It's important, this point. England hosted the World Cup in 1966, at which time homosexuality was completely illegal in England. And they want to talk about Qatar? Go ahead. I know. This is the, this is the ridiculous thing. I mean, they, 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 they do, they're doing this now. And what my belief is, is, I think there's something more sort of corrupt maybe going on because um, it could be, maybe it's like a marketing tactic that, you know, NATO, I, I don't know, that's something that they have in place um, because it's making me wonder what, you know, you know what, why they're doing this now of all times. You know, what, the World Cup, big media attention, and that now they're just, it's like they're trying to turn, um, you know, all the European Western countries against, um, you know, these Arab countries and for their laws. And it just makes me wonder if it's a marketing tactic for something much darker, some propaganda, is NATO involved? Maybe, I don't know, we think they're prepping themselves for an attack on Russia, but really they've got something more sinister going on behind the scenes. I'm not, I'm not sure. So I just wanted to... to... Well, uh, it, it, these are very interesting uh, observations, uh, of course, and uh, I don't know for sure, but there are a number of factors in play. Uh, but before going into them, uh, nobody complains about Qatar's investments in Britain, which run into the hundreds of billions. The Shard in London uh, is their building. They made it. Uh, the uh, the uh, Qataris uh, invest in, in football, in property, in all kinds of things, and no one turns it down. No one says, uh, no, your human rights record is such <laughs> that I don't want you to uh, spend hundreds of billions in the British economy. Uh, so that's one observation to put on the table. But there are a number of factors at play. First of all, Saudi Arabia uh, hates Qatar. And there's a lot of vested interests in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia regards Qatar as rightfully theirs, as it does the United Arab Emirates. Uh, it regards the, those as rightfully theirs, and they regard Qatar as an upstart state, uh, state-let, really. Uh, it's, as I've described it in the past, a petrol station with a flag. Uh, the Saudis hate them, so the people that are hirelings of the Saudis uh, can easily be encouraged to hate them. I think a third factor is that that the Qataris are beginning to lean, like others, like Saudi Arabia, towards the new emerging BRICS, the Eurasian uh, project. Uh, they have refused to up their production of gas to help Western countries out of a hole they dug for themselves. So it's partly a reminder to the Qataris and by extension to the other Gulf countries that, hey, uh, we made you, we can unmake you, we can break you. 
Uh, and uh, I think there's some of that going on. But I'm sorry to tell you that I think there's a strong racist, anti-Arab, anti-Islamic, anti-Muslim prejudice running through it all. Yeah. We can't bear that these guys with towels on their heads uh, have all this money uh, when we, uh, we can't switch our uh, heat on. Uh, these people are not only so rich, they actually control the resources we need to heat our homes and fill our cars. Uh, and it, it's since the 70s I have been conscious of an inherent hatred of the Arabs and the Arab world. And I think that there's a lot of that. Last word to you, Mary. I'm just I'm so honoured to speak to you and thank you so much uh, for listening to my point. And yeah, thank you. Don't <laughs> I've been be very stranger. nervous about ringing the show. Don't be a stranger. <laughs> Thank you. I no, no, be. you've been marvellous. Uh, call us, call us back, please, any time. Caroline uh, is a regular caller, and she's not shy at all. In fact, she says here, "Don't cut me off." Well, it depends what you say, Caroline. Go ahead, Caroline and Cope Bridge, the holy good ground. Evening. Good evening, George. For the benefit of the non-Scottish and non-Celtic supporters, Glasgow Celtic is a football club, as you know. Right, but for the rest of the world, it's a football club, mostly of Catholic and Irish descent. And eight, eight or ten years ago, I believe yourself was sacked and maybe less because you stood with the people like myself that held the Palestinian flag, which was political, after the 1947 rogue state attacked the Gaza Strip. I was asked, to ha fly the Palestinian flag. I gladly and proudly flew that Palestinian flag, but now 85% of your people on this poll is saying it's political. I don't believe, because I don't believe that two men should sleep together, it's wrong. Right, it's not under my roof, not under my roof, but I believe I do personally believe that is their business, right? And because of my beliefs, I wouldn't play for Ireland, because I wouldn't play for Scotland. Ireland's my first country. I wouldn't play, right? I believe, I believe in everybody has human rights. So if these football players are so political and they believe in other people's rights, stand up and be counted. Listen, see my street judge, you know, the Sinn Féin offices, there's only two in Scotland. One in Coat Bridge, one in Glasgow at the Barrows, right? My friend is Scottish, her parents are from Palestine, uh, Pakistan. And she said, is this Scotland, Ireland, or Palestine? When she walked into the street for the first time, I've got three flags out my window. Ireland to my right, Scotland to my left, Palestine in the middle. Some people have only got Palestine and Scotland in the street. Some have just got Palestine and Ireland, right? So when you stood up, when you stood up to that, I don't want to call them, to Lord Sugar, I remember him saying, shut your mouth. I said, really? That's the kind of thing that you see in the street corner and the East End tenement slums growing up. I watched your etiquette, right, and I'm ah, uh, you left them standing, but you were standing beside me and mine when I was political, right. So where's the difference? The guitar, tell your, tell the people on here that you get the sack for standing beside Celtic. No, not not for standing beside Celtic. Though I did stand beside Celtic and always have and always will. But the, uh, you made many points, some of which I strongly agree with, some of which I don't. Uh, but the, the Celtic uh, were fined because some of their supporters flew Palestinian flags at the games. In fact, we've been fined more than once, I think actually as many as three times, for fans, not the club, flying the Palestinian flag. Now... We now live in an era where you're handed a Ukrainian flag 
by the football authorities, where the corner flags are Ukrainian flags, where politics is compulsory in sport as long as it's their politics and not ours. Caroline, that was a tour de force. Here's Brian in Canada on JFK. Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> Hi, George. Yes, I agree with about, say, 70% of uh, the positions you take on various geopolitical matters. That said, I want to I'll point out for that, that I... Brian. 70% okay, but... <laughs> is good for me. <laughs> <laughs> not bad, not bad. That, uh, maybe I'm being generous. I don't know. Anyway, that said, I want to point out that I find it incongruous that you call out various political actors' moral failings, particularly when they are unfaithful Don Juans and sexual bounders, but don't hold President Kennedy to that same standard. Oh, I do. You're, you're quite wrong about that. You're, you're, you're entirely wrong about that. But if you think I should treat Jack Kennedy and Joe Biden uh, as being in the same league, I'm afraid I cannot do that. No, I'm not asking you to do that. But the thing is, you say you, I don't think you have, a, in other words, every other bounder that you've spoken of, you have no respect for whatsoever. Whereas Kennedy, you seem to hold up as a, a, a sort of a moral standard. At well, least I, do. Uh, one I do. I do. I do. Partly, partly, yeah, I do. Partly because of what happened to him. Uh, he did get his brains bro blown out over his <laughs> wife uh, in the back of a car on television. And I did see his little son, the same age as my youngest child, saluting his coffin go by. So I do have uh, um, a sentimental spot for him. I did grow up in a house where uh, the Pope and JFK were on pictures on the wall uh, because he was the first uh, Roman Catholic uh, president of the United States. So I do have a soft spot for him, but that he was a sinner uh, cannot be gainsaid. I have been myself a sinner. Uh, sins for which I hope I have atoned. We'll find out on the judgment day. Uh, but uh, Jack Kennedy was a political giant compared to the politicians that lead my country, your country, and the United States today. Am I right, Brian? Well, most are, for that matter, George. I'm, I'm, I'm old enough that in, when Kennedy was killed, I was working, and we were all shocked and appalled, and, and we all were saddened by the whole process. But let me, I wasn't going to go into this, but very briefly, also bad, that both the Kennedy being president and uh, Robert being uh, the attorney general, they, they hung out the DM to dry over in Vietnam, if you, if you look up that history. Now, that was a terrible failing, and that was a regime, I know that history. regime change. I know, I know that history. I, I know that history. There's nothing you know about the Kennedys that I don't know, I promise you. But I also know uh, that the right wing and the CIA and the FBI hated Kennedy, not for the wars he was in, but for the wars he wouldn't go in. Uh, for Not for the... Uh, military assets he sent to Vietnam, but for the military assets he refused to send to Vietnam. Not for the Bay of Pigs, but for his unwillingness to double down on the Bay of Pigs. Not for uh, the uh, sighting of Soviet missiles in Cuba, but for his refusal to plunge the world into World War III over those missiles. His preference for negotiation over World War III. They hated him because he wanted uh, to introduce equal rights for black people, Bobby Kennedy even more so in the United States. So forgive me if I think you're being a little bit churlish. <laughs> Last okay, one to you. Okay. Now just let me add one thing about right, Kennedy thanks. and the well, Bay quick. of... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. The... Yeah. Go ahead. No, if you're still there, go ahead, Brian. Finish your point. No, he's gone. Okay, more Super Chats. Uh, Stephen Mulholland, five pounds. Thanks, Stephen. Qatar doesn't have Julian Assange in a high max security prison. Point very well made. Klaus Bollard gives 10 US dollars. My good friend Albert Sontag, who gives every week, sends 10 dollars. Thanks, Albert. Tommy Felix sends 50 US dollars. Thank you, Truth Seeker. 
Your torch is bright, strong, and enlightened. Thank you, Tommy. Beautiful words. Galloway Radar, again, gives £4.49. The spooks are coming for you, Joe from New Jersey. And E. Abad gives £1. Mark Jordios gives £10. Thank you. Donald Trump is a bully, but he is what the USA needs right now. I like his policies. I don't need to like him. And Wayne Veach sends 49, uh, South African Rand, 49.99. Thank you, Wayne. Justin sends five US dollars. George, when will the UK legalize cannabis? Sincerely, an American who can buy it legally. I'm not with you on that journey, uh, Justin. Uh, Bruce Lee Roy uh, sends five US dollars. George, what do you think of the 70 million plus to buy a US Senate seat? You know that both parties spent a billion dollars a piece on the US midterms? Wouldn't it be better investing something in somebody to count the votes fairly and quickly? Mary English sends 10 pounds. I love you, George. You have always stood with the Palestinian people, and I hope you always will. Thank you, Mary. You can count on that. Mark Porter sends one US dollar. Thanks. Don't be shy. Send a dollar, send a euro, send a pound, but send it now, either through the Super Chat or through our website, moats.tv. Craig Chambers sends five pounds. Hello sends three euros. Fans want to see the World Cup and not politics. That's certainly true for me. I can't wait to support Iran tomorrow against England. Beer and flies uh, sends 49.99 US dollars. Thank you. Uh, he says, thank you for your show, but the thanks are from me. Galloway Radar, £8.99. Uh, sorry, $8, I think, right, 99 The term redneck comes from the Covenanters. Indeed, it does. Tommy Felix, 50 US dollars. Again, Tommy, thank you. I really appreciate it. Now, my good friend, Isa Ali, is so lucky that he is in Qatar for the World Cup. I couldn't even get into Qatar. Never mind get a ticket for the World Cup. But my friend is there. I wonder if he shares the perspectives I've been expressing this evening. Let's quickly find out. Uh, freelance journalist, political analyst of Middle Eastern politics, Supreme. Isa, welcome, and uh, lucky you uh, being in Qatar. Uh, it was a miserable opening game, but it always is. It was actually less boring than most opening games. Qatar were very, very poor. Uh, they would have been better investing some of their money in naturalizing a few Brazilians uh, and putting them in their national team. But I suppose it's to their credit that they didn't do that. But how... Do people there feel, do you think, about the rampant Orientalism uh, that we are uh, expressing in the Western media about the fact the World Cup is there in the first place? Well, I think uh, it's just great to see you as well, George. I think what we've been seeing here um, in Qatar is a real hardening of attitudes towards what they see as, as you said, you know, a type of colonial arrogance uh, rooted in frankly, racism and the neo-colonial attitude, uh, imperialist attitude, an attitude of uh, superiority. The problem for mainly the West, the Europeans, and uh, to a degree, the North Americans as well, is that their view of the world is myopic. And they are a minority in this view. And, uh, you know, the views here is that there are some criticisms that have been uh, legitimate. For example, when it comes to the issue of workers' rights, the Qataris say, that they've uh, undertaken a large number of reforms. But even the number that's gone around, 6,500 uh, workers killed since the beginning of uh, the bid or the building of these stadiums, it's just simply not true. It's 6,500 people who are foreign workers who have died in the 12 years since here. Now, those people could have died in that interim period from COVID. They could have died from getting hit by a bus. They could have died of a heart attack. And yes, some of them could have died on the uh, site of the building of these stadiums. But yet, even the things that the Qataris accept, which are the workers' rights, even those are rooted in lies. But then when it comes to the other things, you know, this kind of uh, hysterical outpouring when it comes to questions of 
LGBT rights or not being able to buy beer in the stadiums. Again, like last night, I went for a walk in the uh, souk, uh, the market in uh, Do uh, in Doha, and you know, I I saw a gentleman who was maybe one can describe as visibly uh, gay. He wasn't European. It's key to understand. He was a man from uh, East uh, or Southeast Asia, not hiding his identity, not you know, in any way trying to be ashamed of it or scared, no one bothering him. Because in this part of the world, and this is what people may not understand, the concept of, you know, sexual identity as a political identity is completely alien. There is no concept of somebody being uh, gay or straight or any of those things. There are, uh, you know, there's a fluidity in people's sexual identity. And, you know, what people in the West seem to not understand is that the Qatari said have said repeatedly, everyone's welcome. Uh, you can, you know, behave how you like in the privacy of your own homes, but we have certain cultural norms in the public sphere. And the attitude here has been that we've bent over backwards to welcome everybody for the last uh, few years, but that this media campaign is simply too much on the question, uh, for example, of uh, the beer. I mean, I just went to the game. They were serving uh, alcohol in some parts of the ground, mainly the hospitality parts and not in the normal parts of the ground because, frankly speaking, maybe they see that certain groups of fans or a certain type of fan can't be trusted to drink alcohol in the stadiums. And I think that uh, is the key. It's not so much that they uh, are closing off to the rest of the world, but they understand that there are certain behaviours and standards that they want people to behave by. And if, again, the small fringe minority in the West can't seem to understand this and because their worldview is so myopic they don't understand the rest of the world doesn't see it that way it's, it's their loss and i think politically this is going to have ramifications for the west i think uh, qatar are being pushed into a position where they're going to be a lot more you know uh, maybe skeptical of the european countries of britain of germany and of uh, the united states i don't know if you saw george but i was in the stadium but i saw on twitter apparently they didn't play the uh, opening ceremony on the bbc and they were just showing some documentary about um, the so-called ills of Qatar to do with, of course, uh, you know, the workers' rights and LGBT and other things. I mean, it's outrageous. It's really outrageous for the BBC to take such a political stance. Not surprising to myself or to you, but I think for many people here, it's going to be a big wake-up call as to the type of arrogant mentality that still persists to this day. I think that's very interesting uh, that there'll be a backlash, uh, not just in Qatar, but across the Arab world to this. It is frankly racist. Uh, and frank, I, since the 70s, since the uh, oil price quadrupled and it dawned on people in the West that guys with towels on their heads controlled the energy market and uh, their countries could become extremely rich whilst ours was uh, was going down there has been that uh, current in uh, in western opinion political opinion media opinion but someone is behind this it's too big a uh, campaign to have just emerged uh, out of thin air uh, i mean f because the the grand prix is in saudi arabia uh, next month it's already been in Bahrain, uh, and we never got anything like this campaign. What is it about Qatar that has attracted the attention of this big campaign, and who might be behind it, and why? Well, in terms of who's behind it, I think there are two issues, right? So one is a general arrogance in the media class. I mean, look, we both know the type of people that get attracted to work in the Western media, in the British media. We've both been, uh, one could say, <laughs> victims of it because we've seen firsthand the type of you know, class breakdown and the type of mentality uh, in that very liberal-minded uh, media. And I don't mean liberal in terms of uh, you know, having progressive views. I mean liberal mm. in the kind of arrogant worldview uh, that they hold. Uh, so I think there is just a general group thing, but in a specific sense, you look at the difference between the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, and they've even normalized or have warmer ties with uh, the illegal entity known as Israel. But interestingly, here in Qatar, a country that hasn't normalized ties, you're seeing Palestine flags everywhere. 
from Qataris, from Palestinians, from others. This tournament is really, really uh, being utilized as a chance to show solidarity with the Palestinian people, with the Palestinian struggle. It's something that lives in the hearts of Qataris. There was a video that went viral of an Israeli channel trying to interview people in the in the souk, and one market stall owner saying, oh, what, where are you from? The guy says, we're from Israel. He says, oh, I'm not talking to your station. And the uh, host was shocked. And, uh, you know, you've, you, there are uh, Israelis here. Uh, from what I understand, the condition for them to be allowed here is that Palestinians also have to be allowed to visit as well in equal number uh, from uh, the West Bank, I believe. So uh, we haven't seen any visible signs of uh, those Zionists here. I think they know perfectly well the strength of feeling towards them. And maybe that's one of the under pinnings of this kind of backlash that, you know, Mohammed bin Salman is fine, Mohammed bin Zayed in the Emirates is fine because ultimately they're no threat to the imperial order, they're no threat to Israel, they're no threat to Zionism. Yet Qatar still, uh, whatever you think of their politics, whatever you think of them, they haven't normalized with that state. And actually you're seeing, as you were just saying there, uh, a strengthening of feeling in the Arab and the Muslim world and frankly in the non-European world. And people are rallying around Qatar and they're supporting Qatar because they can see this for the agenda-driven dribble that it is. Tell me, uh, we've only got a minute. Tell me, uh, what's your tip? You're there on the ground. Who's the winner of the World Cup, do you think? I, I think it's going to be Brazil. I hope it's going to be Brazil. I think they've got a really good team this year. Got a couple of Arsenal players in there as well. So uh, I've got a uh, vested interest in Brazil. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think they could do well. And obviously, the French will always do well, although they do have a few injuries. But my, uh, if I was a betting man, my money would be on Brazil. Uh, and who are you supporting tomorrow, England or Iran? <laughs> uh, there was once a saying about a so-called cricket test. Let's just say I'd be failing that cricket test and supporting Iran. <laughs> <laughs> you, you and me both, my friend, you and me both. Thank you very much indeed, Isa Ali, for talking to us from Qatar. Maybe come back next week and uh, we'll, uh, we'll update things. Thanks very much indeed. Simon is on the line in London to talk about the World Cup. Go ahead, Simon. Hello, George. Yeah, today I was very angry, very, very angry after watching the first hour of the World Cup intro on the BBC. I almost punched through a wall and I was raging. The first 50 minutes, right, didn't even talk about football at all. All they were talking about is this uh, human rights issue. Uh, in the last 10 minutes, just before the game, they started talking about the, uh, uh, the, the, the Premier League players in Ecuador, in the Ecuador squad, purely because they're from the Premier League and no other reason, you know. So it kind of shows the level of intelligence that Gary Lineker and his pundits are, are the, the thick as mints. There's no other, there's no other word to describe it. And the other thing, the, it, was an, it was nothing more than a diatribe of prejudice and racism against brown-skilled Muslim people, you know, uh, b b b by, by these four stupid uh, pundits on national TV. I mean, if they hate Qatar so much, why did they go there? That's the first thing, right? They, they only went there for the money because they're going to make huge amounts of money on this. Gary Lineker early on this uh, week said he's not going to celebrate, um, he's not there to celebrate his report, which is just a lot of nonsense, because if now England score in any of their games, they can't, they can't show Gary Lineker celebrating, because um, he himself has said he won't celebrate. Now, if I was a Qatari leader or dictator, I would whip him for the insolence, because you've gone into someone else's country, you're reporting from someone else's country, surely there has to be a degree of respect. There's absolutely no respect they're showing whatsoever. They've gone there, and uh, they, they've, they've uh, I mean, for starters, we have no moral high ground, George, in talking down to other countries about human rights you've covered that very well on your show especially after do after we what we did to people in other countries and journalists in our country like julian Assange, you know and uh, just to kind of go back on the uh, the, the guest you were just speaking to a lot of criticism is also due to the arab league and the saudis after their sheer hatred i'm guessing for al jazeera they're not happy with al jazeera because they've received criticism from al jazeera uh, uh and and uh, who, who criticized the uh saudi regime and i think that's one of the reasons why the saudis 
news combined with the BBC have like upped this um, criticism to such high levels, you know. And of course, there's an also a huge degree of envy towards the Qatari uh, tourism industry as well. However, just watch, George. You know, tomorrow when when our boys run play, and I'm calling them our boys because I'm I'm hoping they win. Of course, I'm hoping I'm hoping that Iran defend, 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 and in the last minute of injury time, they win a penalty. I want them to go. I want England. I'm sorry to say in my English my friends, but I want England to go out in the cruelest way. And um, they'll, before the match, they'll use the, the crudest possible propaganda. Uh, they'll, they'll start talking about women's rights in Iran and the headscarf and so on, you know. But when Saudis play Argentina later on in the week, they won't even talk about it. They'll, what, what they'll do is they'll concentrate on Messi and the skill of the Argentinian players, but they won't say anything at all about, um, about Saudi Arabia and the, and the crimes they've committed. Uh, Well, I'm sorry you've been cut off because that's the best call of the night. So you are the caller of the night. And I'd like to, if I have time, respond to some of the points that you have made uh, brilliantly. Um, it is utter disrespect. If you didn't want to give it to a country that doesn't allow people to stagger around drunk in public, you shouldn't have given it to Qatar. But once you did give it to Qatar, you have to respect that they are a sovereign, independent country with a culture. And that is a different culture to you. The, if you can't last 90 minutes without alcohol, you've got a problem, mate. You can drink back in your hotel. If you can't last the length of time it takes you to attend a football match, Without alcohol, you have got a problem. It's true you can't walk around in Qatar hand in hand or kissing. But that's true whether you're hand in hand with a woman or a man. Same sex or opposite sex. It's true that you cannot display affection in public in Qatar, whatever your sexual orientation, because that's their culture. That's their law. If you didn't want to do that, you shouldn't have given the tournament to Qatar in the first place. But once you did, you were accepting that they have different cultures and different mores, different laws to you. Not that, and as you correctly pointed out, we are on any kind of moral high ground. Sure, we allow gay people to kiss in England, but we threw Julian Assange in a dungeon at Belmarsh Jail, and we are planning on sending him away forever to a maximum security penitentiary in Colorado in the United States. It's true that you can drink alcohol at a British football match. Uh, but it's also true that we have ruled a third of the people of the world as colonial subjects and ruled 25% of the territory of the world. It's true that we were the first country to abolish the slave trade, but it's also true that we were the biggest practitioners of the slave trade, that our country grew rich and fat on the slave trade. It's true that you can behave as you like in British society, but it's also true that we are funding and arming and propagandizing for some of the worst tyrannies on the earth, some of them not very far from Qatar. And it is also true that whilst I have many criticisms of Al Jazeera, in particular since the beginning of the civil war in Syria, which was joined by all of these countries now slandering Qatar, but propagandized for by Qatar and its television station, Al Jazeera. And I have 
serious differences. With Al Jazeera, I haven't been on it in 10 years. I used to be on it practically every day. I have serious differences with the government of Qatar, though I used to uh, have tea with the ambassador at his invitation. Uh, but for a decade or more, I have had no contact with them. So I'm not here shilling for Qatar. Uh, but I believe in truth. And I believe in justice, whoever it's for, whoever it's against. And Qatar is being treated unjustly by some of the biggest hypocrites, practitioners of the worst, lowest double standards anywhere to be found in the world. I don't think that countries up to their neck in the blood in Ukraine, in Palestine, in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and many other places in the world have any right at all to lecture other people about their behavior, especially when their behavior pales into insignificance compared to yours. That's all, alas, that I've got time for. I wish I could speak on. I have much more to say, but I will be back God willing, on Wednesday at 9 p.m. UK time for the midweek mother of all talk shows. And I hope you'll join me then. Until then, enjoy the World Cup. I intend to. Viva Iran!